As humans, we tend to feel that we are special and unique, and that somehow the laws of nature don't apply to us. We think that we have free will, which allows us to make decisions for ourselves and not to be subjected to the faceless and impartial forces of adaptive selection. Well, it is true that we are special and unique, but then so are all the other animals too. We're no more unique than the bioluminescent Phyloriza punctatus jellyfish or the blue-footed booby. We're just different from them, as they are from each other. One thing that we do have in common is that human behavior has also evolved in order to serve our best adaptive needs. Just like the egret parent does not need to know why it tolerates siblicide in its nest in order for it to be adaptive, or why it thinks it can ride on alligators and get away with it, the same is true for human behaviors. Our psychological mechanisms that make us think in certain ways are also proxies for making us behave in certain ways that will impact upon our fitness over time. Our ecological contexts are different from those of other animals, so we're not going to behave in exactly the same ways, but we have our own ways of making sure to maximize our own fitness levels. We may think that our cultures are a purely human invention, and are evidence to support the notion that we humans are playing by completely different behavioral rules than the rest of the animals. Although culture is just a regionally specific way of doing things, and many animals have shown learned regional culture, such as elephants, Caledonian crows, seen here stubbornly refusing to use the twig tools that they're famous for and Japanese macaques, which taught themselves to wash their food. Also, when we look at culturally mediated behaviors in different groups of humans, we find that they often serve similar purposes. If we look at these young ladies from widely distant and different cultures, young Maasai women from Tanzania in their traditional beaded decorations, next to some North American social media influencers on the right. We may think that there's no common thread to the social communicative behaviors that we're seeing from each vastly different culture. Unless we were to note that each of the young ladies is attired in a way that suggests desirability in their culture, that the makeup and personal demeanors create an allure of youthful fertility and health and their acceptance and position into social classes that illustrate the same values show that she has a meaningful place in her society and can benefit from a lifetime of support. For young ladies who are in their reproductive prime and in the market for a potential mate and life partner, these would be helpful messages to be sending and the behaviors have evolved to back them up. One important distinction of human behavior that needs to be considered is how recently we have changed our ecological context from the way it was throughout most of our evolutionary history. Considering that humans as a genus have been around for the last 2.5 million years since Homo habilis came on the scene in sub-Saharan regions of Africa, and that the Industrial Revolution, which brought us modern Homo sapiens into the technological age, only began around 250 years ago. This means that over 99.9% .9 of our human evolutionary history has occurred during pre-industrial times. Because evolution by natural selection works over many generations, 
we will find that the very recent changes to our interactions with the laws of nature will have occurred too recently for humans to fully adapt to our new contexts. Given that our human ancestors evolved in a world where the men were the main family providers and women were the homemakers, much of our evolutionary psychology is still tailored to this scenario, which is increasingly becoming outdated and irrelevant. Although we live in a world that is thankfully moving quickly forward towards gender equality and allowing such scenarios in which women can have as much if not more professional success than men, and assisted childcare means that single parents can do as well or better than a traditional nuclear family had in the past, the evolutionary reality is that our genes are still coding for behaviors that were relevant to our pre-industrial history. In many instances, our modern behaviors are vestigial carryovers from our evolutionary past, and many may not be relevant anymore or in some cases, have become maladaptive in our new ecological contexts. For example, humans evolved cravings for salt when we evolved our sweat glands as a thermal regulatory system on the hot African plains, when the dangers of an overheated human would also lead to important losses in salts through the sweat glands. In that environment, salts were not abundant, and maximizing your salt intake whenever possible would have made adaptive sense to nomadic, sweaty humans of the past. Nowadays, our cravings for salts can be maladaptive, as we're not all sweaty hunters under an equatorial sun, and therefore an overabundance of salt available in our diets leads to health problems like hypertension and heart disease. Also, in a pre-industrial human society, women who found themselves pregnant without the committed help of a providing male partner would have been in a very difficult situation trying to stay alive and feed another mouth without any employment or help to raise that child. Likewise, any man that mated with a woman who had complications during birthing would usually find himself widowed as both the child and wife were likely to have died during labor in those instances. So, despite our modern advances in social and medical technologies that help ourselves survive and reproduce more effectively than were ever possible in the pre-industrial evolutionary past, the reality of our evolved behaviors is that they have not had time to adjust to the rapid shifts in command over our environment. Our psychologies still make us behave in ways that were tailored to the fitness outcomes of a pre-industrial and often irrelevant past. With these considerations in mind, an analysis of our behavior as humans becomes more easily recognizable as adaptive traits having evolved to help us act in the interest of our personal fitness outcomes. This is especially true when we look at the behaviors involved in mate attraction and choice. In humans, men have played an important role as providers for the family, and they still do in many cases. In addition, the genes that they will provide to the offspring will be of importance to the fitness of their mother. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the traits that contribute to male attractiveness and that females use to evaluate mate potential involve a combination of those that signal about the quality of his genes and his ability to provide for a family. For many male animals, humans included, the best litmus test for the quality of their genes is to assess how well they manage to develop features that are under the control of testosterone. As we know already, testosterone is the male sex hormone and its presence is required for male sexual readiness, but that it also comes with important costs to the immune system. For these reasons, only males of good genetic quality can carry the products of high testosterone levels and display them flawlessly. On inferior quality males, those stressors would be more likely to lead to health defects and developmental problems over their lives. 
In human males, one of the more obvious effects of testosterone is of masculinizing facial features. With the growth of strong, square and rugged jaw and brow lines, making high and pronounced cheekbones, and the presence of facial hair. These characteristics have become so associated with human males that they're typically referred to as stereotypical masculine features. When women are given a series of photographs of male faces that have been digitally modified to show higher or lower levels of masculinity across these facial features, the women typically rate the more masculine ones as being sexier and more dominant. However, when the women are asked to rate the same faces on attractiveness, they tend to choose the more intermediate faces that do not show extreme levels of masculinity or femininity. This suggests that while there may be an innate sexual attraction to rugged males with high levels of testosterone, that there may be a conflict with their role as a caring and nurturing provider. Sexy males may be preferred as genetic donors to reproduction, but not so much as long-term providers, simply because that high level of testosterone may make them more aggressive towards their wives or children and would also make them more attractive to other women, leading to offers of infidelity down the road. This trade-off between sexual attraction to men of high genetic quality and testosterone levels, compared to the intimate love relationship with caring and nurturing provider men, comes into stark contrast during the women's menstrual cycle. Research has shown that women are more attracted to masculine men during the ovulatory phase of their cycle, and would be more likely to engage in one-night stands with one of them. Outside of their ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle, women tend to prefer the idea of having a caring and nurturing partner around. These conflicting reproductive approaches would make sense in a pre-industrial world, where a woman's preference for a stable provider male at most times would make the best adaptive sense towards the contributions and care for his family. However, when the timing is just right, a woman may engage in an extra pair copulation and find herself with an offspring with high quality genetics, without having to deal with the overly aggressive man who fathered it. When women are evaluating men as potential providers to her and the family, she's not just looking at his demeanor and willingness to be kind and caring, but also his potential prospects for being a successful breadwinner and his ability to support her and any potential family they might create together. In surveys across many cultures of human societies, when asked for the ideal age of their imagined male partner, their answers suggest that women have a tendency to prefer men that are a few years older than they are. This preference for older men supports the notion that they're in part considering his ability to be a good provider for their family. Because it takes some time after reaching adulthood for young men to reach a point of professional and financial success, that small age difference would have given a potential mate a few years head start in that process. To be sure, nowadays women can be just as successful as men in the workplace and are not reliant on men for support. But surveys show that even these age preferences exist in highly successful professional women, indicating a biological basis for this adaptive trait. In pre-industrial times, a man that was looking to make a family needed to make sure that his potential mate was physiologically able to produce offspring and to be able to take care of them. All this in the face of poor sanitary conditions and the complete lack of any kind of medical intervention in case of complications during any of the stages along the way. For these reasons, a man's fitness success back in the day was largely contingent on the fertility of his wife and many of the traits that are seen as attractive in women and that are used in mate choice evaluation are those that relate to indicators of her fertility and her potential to bear and care for children. 
due to the constraints of squeezing the large head of human babies through a small pelvic girdle, the most common complication in birthing would be from an inability to get the baby out. Before cesarean section operations were invented, this blockage would have meant certain death for both mother and child. The pre-industrial reproductive challenges did not end there. Following a successful birth, human parents are thrust into a situation of caring for a completely helpless little baby that requires breast milk to keep them alive for the first year of its life. Although very wealthy women in the past could have afforded to have wet nurses to breastfeed their babies, there was no such thing as store-bought formula and no other substitute would work. Therefore, most women who couldn't feed their offspring would also see her and her man's baby die and both of their fitness levels drop to zero. These would have been sadly common situations and therefore they would weigh heavily on male mating behaviors as a consequence. Men around the world have a strong preference for a female body shape that resembles an hourglass, with large birthing hips, slender and fit bellies, and large breasts capable of good lactation. Although the attractiveness may vary on the preferred overall girth of the women, with some cultures preferring women that are a little slender, and others like those with a little bit more plumpness. The hourglass shape is consistently seen as the ideal ratio for evaluating the sexiness of those critical body features in reproductively viable women. Just like in men, women's faces are also judged for attractiveness, but again the features that are preferred by men are also those that are strongly correlated with fertility. Irrespective of a woman's body shape, overall fertility declines rapidly with age after a peak in their late teens and early twenties. This decline is so rapid that a woman's reproductive potential has typically dropped by half within a decade after this. In the absence of any assisted reproductive technologies, that is. When men evaluate the attractiveness of women's faces, the features that are most commonly cited as being considered attractive are those that also decline with age. The features that have come to be associated with the standards of female beauty include plump colorful lips, rosy cheeks, and firm lines around the eyes. So strong is this preference that billion dollar industries exist to support our insecurities about that appearance and attempting to amplify these youthful cues of fertility. It has been argued that these stereotypes of female beauty are manifestations of men and perpetuated by media and marketing through magazines, movies, and fashion industries. In truth, even babies who are unblemished by these market forces show strong preferences for women's faces with these youthful signals of attractiveness which demonstrates that this is not a learned behavior and does have a biological basis somewhere in our genes. Because of this relationship between a woman's age and her reproductive potential, it may not be surprising that men across all cultures tend to prefer their potential female partners to be somewhat younger than they are in order to maximize this fertility window if they're to successfully raise a family together. Just like in so many other animals, the reproductive behaviors of human men and women differ slightly based on what is more important to their own reproductive fitness outcomes. For the humans mating over the near totality of our evolutionary history, women's mate choices were largely contingent on his ability and willingness to provide and men's mate choices could be starkly impacted upon by variations in fertility of his potential partners. Because of these somewhat divergent realities to the reproductive scenarios of men and women, our psychologies have also evolved in slightly different manners, so as to make us behave in our own self-interest, and to prevent the loss of what the other is bringing to that partnership. One such psychological mechanism is jealousy, 
whose role is to make us behave in such a way as to protect what is most valuable in our mating relationships. And unsurprisingly, the nature of that jealousy differs between men and women. When heterosexual men and women are asked about situations that might make them very jealous, men typically report that they would become more jealous of sexual infidelity, that is, finding that their woman partner is having sex with another man. Whereas women tend to become more jealous at relationship infidelity, or the thought of their man partner developing a close personal relationship with another woman. These different forms of jealousy act to protect each sex from losing what is most important to them in the relationship. A man whose woman sleeps with another man may find himself caring for someone else's offspring and losing his own fitness benefits in the process. A woman who finds her man in a close relationship with another woman risks finding her support and family care lost as he diverts that to the other woman. This sexual conflict shows that the reproductive strategies of men and women do differ and that the consequences of making poor mate choices will also have different impacts on either sex. In pre-industrial times, an unwanted pregnancy could have been considered a win-win for a ruthless man, who gets another offspring without having to take care of it. Thankfully these days we have laws that make us share that responsibility. But those are new features on the evolutionary timescale. This stark contrast to the realities of sexual reproduction in men and women have influenced both of their sexual attitudes. And men are generally much more promiscuous and willing to engage in casual sex than women are, who tend to want to develop some kind of trusting relationship before committing to sex. Remember that before modern contraceptive or abortive technologies, Casual sex would have run the very real risk of producing children. In those days, the most successful reproduction outcomes for women would be from patience and choosiness over mating partners, and for men to have as much promiscuous sex as they could. Those kinds of psychologies do persist nowadays, and the sex drive of men is generally much more revved up than that of women, and having sex often takes up much of a young man's attention, particularly as they go through their puberty and young adult phases when sexual impulses come flooding out like a tsunami. An unfortunate consequence of the different levels of sexual readiness or willingness to engage in casual sex is when men will force themselves sexually on women. These men are truly the losers of society in both a literal and metaphorical sense, because they couldn't win the mating game by being chosen for their charm and beauty, and that they're seen as societal scumbags, because we thankfully now have norms and laws that make these kinds of reprehensible behaviors completely unacceptable. In earlier, more lawless times, however, coercive sex could be the only strategy for these loser males to pass on any genes to the next generation. And in a world without birth control pills or abortions, the women who were victims of rape would often be left raising those young on their own while the toxic males in their society benefited from these adaptive loopholes. Nowadays, rape as a reproductive strategy would be maladaptive, thankfully, as it would be unlikely to lead to successful pregnancy, and in the best of cases, the rapist would rot in jail. However, it is still important to note when aberrant and distasteful human behaviors may have somewhat of a biological basis, even if the sociology of the context is also crucial to understand. By saying that a reprehensible human behavior has a biological basis is by no means justifying it or excusing it in any way, by saying that it's natural and inevitable. Quite the contrary, in fact. By recognizing that some of the factors that contribute to incidents of rape are related to the high sex drive in males and the challenges of properly courting women for relationships allows us to understand some of the ways in which we can work to prevent these behaviors from happening in the future. 
For example, as the father of a young boy, I feel that I have a heavy responsibility to train him well so that he knows how to behave as an adult when he's on his own. I want him to be able to enjoy a healthy and happy love and sex life in the future, and so I'm doing my best now to help him become a charming, interesting, and caring individual, which will increase his chances of being picked for some of those relationships, but also so that he knows the boundaries of acceptable and unacceptable behaviors when you're a human living in society. As we've seen, animal behaviors have evolved to serve the fitness interests of those animals. And humans are no exception. Like any behavior, however, their adaptive value depends largely on the context in which it's found and applied. Human society has changed our environmental and ecological context so rapidly that we're now only playing catch-up with our bodies and minds. We've come a long way in improving life for ourselves, for the most part, and there's still much room for improvement. We've also been making a bit of a mess along the way, and environmental destruction and social injustices are going to need to be dealt with if we're going to make it to the next level in human evolution. While much of our current and future progress depends on technological discoveries and developments, we'll also benefit in this process. If we can look inwards and try better to understand our own behaviors that shape our actions for the better. After all, we named ourselves Homo sapiens, or intelligent humans. That means that we have the power to shape our environment, but also ourselves, and the future. <laughs>